The Money Show. Personal Finance with Warren Ingram. Warren Ingram is a director at Galileo Capital. He is a personal financial advisor and gives us his time every Thursday night to talk to you about money and to help you make more sense of your money each and every single week on The Money Show. And uh, at inflection points in our history, and they seem to be coming with, with greater rapidity, Warren Ingram, uh, we could, you know, I think a lot of people after the trials and tribulations of March, April last year, there was a lot of panic and a lot of money went offshore at precisely the wrong moment and people were buying the wrong thing at the wrong time and making bad decisions. Um, and then stock markets recovered, the RAND strengthened and everybody went, Oh, thank goodness. And now suddenly we're back in a zone where people are going, well, that was stupid. We wasted an opportunity. Quickly, offshore, go, go, go. I'm guessing there's quite a lot of that going on. You're right. And 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 uh, um, the kind of inbox is starting to flood with questions like, you know, can I cash in my provident fund, uh, you know, pay the tax and send the money out? And, and you know, how quickly can we do this? How, you know, how fast can we just convert everything, um, et cetera, et cetera? So, so I think that there there is a, an element of that, and and you know if it's not that extreme at the moment, just lots of people sitting there with very big, very wide eyes, uh, almost in a state of shock. You know, it's in, interesting to compare it to reactions, as you say, to last year, uh, to to the whole Nene Gate thing, which is always for me, you know, one of the most shocking times we've had, and and our, it feels to me like our nation is more kind of in, in parallel to that time than to what happened last year. You know, it feels to me like lots of people just sitting there with absolute disbelief. Okay, so let's not talk about the merits and demerits. We, I think we've discussed often enough that it is sensible if you've got, if you live in South Africa, whether you intend to stay in South Africa or not, whatever the case might be, it is sensible to have a proportion of your money um, outside of the country. Um, we, South Africa makes up less than 1% of the global economy. Our stock market is minuscule. We've got very few investment options relative to the great excitement of the big world out there in terms of the huge technological revolution that is uh, driving growth in the U.S. stock market, the huge um, technological innovations of Asia. We just don't have direct access to those other than through NUSPAS, um, which is, you know, the, the one trick South Africa sort of one trick pony of our markets. So uh, there are some pitfalls. And can we focus on the pitfalls this evening? Tell me what not to do. Lots of people want to take money offshore. They're going to be scammed and there are going to be lots of people willing to charge them huge, fee, huge fees to take their money out the country if that's what they want to do. So what do we need to look out for? I think there are a couple of uh, starting points. So the, the first is uh, th that decision to convert your rands to another currency is, is one where lots of people, you know, they spend an enormous amount of time and effort trying to figure out should they convert it to dollars, to pounds, you know, euros, or maybe a combination. And then, you know, what about, you know, what about the yen? And, you know, what about China? And, and, and more and more, you know, people asking about, shouldn't we do a portion into cryptos, et cetera? And I always think when you're sending your money overseas, uh, you know, your first purpose is to diversify your, your risks and your opportunities away from South Africa. So, you know, worrying too much about, you know, having enough exposure to the yen and the euro and the dollar and the pound, uh, I think it kind of distracts you from, from the, the real purpose of what you're doing. And the real purpose is diversification. And, and so as a starting point, you know, I think rather choose one currency and try not to be too clever. In, in, to, to me, when we try and second guess what the markets are going to do, we end up making a lot of mistakes as human beings. So, if it's me and I'm just looking for diversification, I, I would say just I'm going to buy the dollar. It's the world's biggest currency. And I'm not going to worry too much about it because actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to buy a global investment. So I'm going to buy things that are, you know, in America, in uh, the UK, in Europe, in China, in, uh, you know, the rest of Asia and Japan. And so they're all ultimately going to get priced back to, to the dollar. That doesn't mean all my investments are in America only in dollars. So, so focusing on on all these different currencies, I think you know is 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 a mistake. Uh, and so, and secondly, when you convert your rands, you're trying to bulk up your money as much as possible because you need to limit the transaction costs you're going to be charged. And I think that's something that people lose focus on. They they, they focus on the convenience and the speed, and and then they realize after the fact that you know their bank charged them two percent, you know, as a commission, and and then another half a percent extra in the difference between the buying price of the 
of the dollars and the selling price. And, and before they know it, you know, they, they've gone backwards by a lot. And all they needed to do was actually, you know, focus on being efficient and, and being as much of the, the capital as possible at the at the best price possible. So, so first mistake is don't buy too many currencies at once, rather buy one. You know, if you're doing a huge amount of money and, and a huge amount of money, it, it, I think for, for people in this context would be kind of, you know, over the 5 million rand. You know, once you're over the 5 million, then maybe you start to, to diversify your currency purchases as well. But below that, one currency, do dollars, don't, don't worry too much about it. Um, and, and then the second bit, you can, yep. No, 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 you're sorry. I, I, can I not breathe? Just one breath in. I was going to interrupt, <laughs> but you know, I'm so used to it. I knew you were going to interrupt. So, so I thought, well, get, get, give it a go and see what happens. Um, so, the point. so I think the the the, the second big uh, big issue will be where you um, where you put your money, where your actual money is going to live. Now, you know, if you've if you've heard us talk over the years, you're going to be you know inclined to to you know follow Warren Buffett or you know follow you know buy Apple or use, you know buy Microsoft. All uh, you know all um, all of those are sensible. I'm not saying that they're not they're not good ideas, but but the critical point is if you're going to buy, for example, Warren Buffett's company Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, that, that means you might well be buying a share listed on the stock exchange in America. Sounds all good and well, you know, it's a, the biggest stock exchange around. It's a, you know, buying Berkshire Hathaway is, a, you know, never going to be a really stupid idea. The only problem is that when you do that and you have more than $60,000 in America uh, in investments uh, as a non-resident, you need to be careful of something uh, called CITES tax. And, and that's basically just... Uh, for, for want of a better word, it's going to be inheritance taxes or death duties. And so if any money you have in America that's worth more than $60,000, if you pass away, you're going to pay the American receiver of revenue, their the IRS, um, 40% of the value of your investments over $60,000. And, and that should be a huge red flag for everybody. So, you know, so we, we all get excited about, you know, buying our exchange traded funds, the Vanguard exchange traded funds or the Berkshire Hathaway shares in America. And, and you know, we, we're, we think we're doing a great job for ourselves and our family. But then, you know, we, the unexpected happens. We pass away and, and 40 percent of our hard earned savings are, be, are being given away to a, a, a tax man who's never given us a single benefit in our lives. And, and so I think that that's a, a huge issue that a lot of people just miss. And unfortunately, you're going to pay a similar sort of rate of tax if you had your money sitting in the UK. The, the amount is more, so, so it amounts over £325,000. And, and you might well be paying similar kinds of taxes if you had your money sitting in Germany or France or you know, anywhere in mainland Europe. So, so that's a huge issue that we just need to be really careful about when we invest our money. And, the, 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 and it's called the domicile, so where your money lives. And to me, the, the constructive thing to do there is look at places like um, Ireland, uh, the, the Channel Islands, the, you know, the, 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 um, the, that's Jersey, Guernsey, Isle of Man, a place like Switzerland or, or Malta, because those places, they don't charge double taxes. They, they are not going to charge a non-resident in those countries any form of tax. So that means you are still going to pay tax, but you're only going to pay tax in South Africa. And I think that that's a critical point when, when we're looking at where we, we send our money. And then the, the other big one is make sure that uh, you don't need another will in another country. You know, so for example, if you pass away as a South African with a South African will and you've got investments in Switzerland, you're okay because they recognize the South African will and the South African letters of executorship. But, you know, for example, if you're currently working in Dubai uh, and, and you pass away there, you, you might be uh, exposed to a different set of laws uh, completely. And you might need a different will there. And, and if you haven't got a proper will and it's and you still got your South African will, you, you might really have a huge issue there or your beneficiaries definitely will. Uh, so, so, so I think that those are probably the first two big issues, Bruce, is you know, converting your, your currency and, and the second, where your money lives. And it's the thing that people don't think about. Um, I mean, yeah, sure, the currency thing maybe is a bit more obvious, but that domicile of money, it's mad. It really is mad. But it does matter and it matters more than you can ever imagine i think in the in the us it's the value of over sixty thousand dollars in the uk it's over three hundred and twenty five thousand pounds which in real money is an awful lot of money that's like seven million rand um but at the same time you know 
you mustn't be thinking just of next week or tomorrow. You've got to be thinking of 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. Uh, hopefully that money grows in value and, and you end up with a tax problem. But you've got to be cognizant of that, that, that tax consequence uh, for the future because what a pain it would be um, if you if you don't take cognizance of that and everything you were trying to protect your, your, your beneficiaries from um, ends up coming to naught because you didn't think about it nearly hard enough. Okay, Warren, so that's a good one. Thank you very much for that. And, and still, for the vast majority of us, you can just sit in South Africa and buy a global fund. Um, and, you know, yes, the money comes back to you in rands, but you're not doing the fancy stuff. Um, you are just, you know, you, your money lives, uh, works offshore, but lives at home, perhaps. Not a bad idea. I think especially if you're doing, uh, let's say, a monthly debit order. You know, I mean, most most people building up money don't have the luxury of of sending out a million rand at a time or three or four you know, million rand at a time. They're going to be doing their you know five, ten, fifteen thousand rand debit orders, and and that, that, that's an enormously expensive way to to kind of convert your rands to dollars and send it out and then try and make an investment on the other side. So so doing monthly debit orders into into rand based but but global investments is is really I, I don't think is a bad idea at all in the exchange traded fund world you know those would be the they, they would generally be called global funds in the unit trust world they've they they've got a horrible name they're called feeder funds um, and and so you know and the reason is because it's a south african unit trust that feeds money into a global unit trust and, and i don't think it's a bad idea however when you start to get to to a decent size of money and again i think that's somewhere around five hundred thousand rand I would I would seriously suggest that you convert that money and send it out, and and I, and and the reason I say that is is kind of not not so much what's happened this week, although that that you know that does raise some scary prospects for a lot of us, but but it's just that we don't know how policies change in the future. We don't know what can happen, and and so to get that diversification and making sure that you've got a spread of assets in multiple countries, uh, um, in multiple currencies, does make a lot of sense to me. I think. Now, even though you get the investment diversification benefit now of these feeder funds or global ETFs, uh, over time, try and build up the money. You know, if you never have to leave South Africa and everything goes brilliantly here, wonderful, you've still got the diversification. But if you do have to, uh, at least you've got some peace of mind that, that you've got multiple risks covered. Okay, good. Um, then a question this evening from somebody who directed it to me, but I'm directing it to you. Uh, it's called Passing the Buck. Looking at the current situation, the looting in the country, coupled with the lockdown, also the value of the rand to the dollar, will this be the right time to buy shares? I know you like the timing questions. Uh, what I learned is that you have to buy when prices are low and such as when the right time is approaching, your value will increase. Is this the right time? Oh, you're going to have a field there with that question. The Money Show. Personal Finance with Warren Ingram. So quite briefly, I think you could deal with this one quite quickly, Warren, in terms of timing the market and people's attitude towards, oh, now the rand is a bit stronger, we better invest now, or share markets are up, or share markets are down, whatever it is, timing is such a fool's errand, in my view. What's yours? I, I agree, and I think uh, you know history proves that it's incredibly difficult to to be a good market time. And, and I think just to understand the, the reason for that is – you always make three decisions when you decide to make a market timing decision. It's not just one decision. So, so for example, if you believe in market timing, that means that you, you believe you have the ability to buy shares. You know, if we're talking about shares now, you, you believe you have the, the ability to buy shares when they are cheap. And, and so that means that you, that you have some kind of foresight into what's going to happen uh, in, in the future. And so the price that you're paying today tells you that the share is cheap. And, and so, for example, just in, in real time in the last week, that means you were buying shares on Monday when, when, when the retail sector was getting hammered because you knew that the, the shares were suddenly cheap and that they were going to jump up in value. So, so your first decision is you have to buy the shares when they're cheap. Then your second decision is you're going to have to sell them when you know they are expensive, when you know that they are about to turn over and, and, and go down in price again. So, so that's a, a very difficult decision to make. You know, we, we, we might know, for example, when the stock markets are carrying on and they're running and running and running, that we start to say, well, gee, things are pricey. And, and a lot of us have been saying that about NASPAS for a very long time. Uh, but guess what? It just kept on going for, for you know, almost decades now and, and certainly has powered ahead. So, so you've got to make that decision right and you've got to sell. 
Then you've got to make another decision, which is then you've got to wait for the thing to fall over, the share price, and then buy it again when it's cheap again. And, and history shows fu that fund managers, that uh, stockbrokers, that private investors, they, they don't get those three decisions consistently right with investments. They, they might get the one right. They might buy cheap. Uh, they might sell when things become quite expensive, but they can't do the, the next leg, which is buy cheap again. That it's almost impossible. And, and one of my favorite studies uh, of all time is one by three academics called Brinson, Hood, and Bebauer. Uh, you know, f fabulous names together. But, but they would say, in the real world with real money, market timing will move your money up or down by about 2% over a long period of time. So out of every 100%, only 2% will be, will be determined by market timing. And this isn't theory. This is looking at real, in the real world with real portfolios of money, what have investors done? And, and they managed to get it, uh, you know, to have a 2% impact. That, that, that's just a waste of time. You know, in, in reality, I think, I, I mean, I love the, the question in terms of, you know, if things are cheap, should I buy? Yes, you should. But then you should be saying, I'm buying and my, my holding period is for, forever. Then, by all means, you know that that's a great time to do it. Absolutely, and the fact is, if you sit on the sidelines waiting for the right moment, you're going to miss a hundred right moments before you finally commit ten years down the track. By which time, you've missed out on ten years of compounding. So, don't be caught out by waiting on the sidelines. Very briefly, quick phrase of the week for you, Warren. What is a bear market? Is this you making a prediction, or is it just a random choice of phrase? Uh, no, no, it's not. No, no, no predictions. Um, you're making me nervous now. Definitely no predictions at all. So, so a bear market is is when the stock market crashes, but it's not a small crash. It's it's generally, I mean, it's not not an ac academic term, but it's generally when the stock market falls by more than twenty percent uh, in, in a very short space of time. So, if that happens, then then you'll start to hear, you know, the the punter saying that we're in a bear market now, and and you know the world's ended, and everyone's really gloomy. Uh, and, and so, yeah, that's our phrase, bear market. Thank you, Warren Ingram at Galileo Capital.